And welcome to the 17th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Um, I have apologies from Tavi Scott and Liam MacArthur will attend at some point. Um, and also um, apologies from Bruce Crawford and David Torrance is here in place of uh, Bruce Crawford. Um, can I ask that uh, everyone has electronic devices switched to in flight mode so that they don't uh, interfere with the, the electronic equipment. Uh, thank you. Uh, item one, can we agree to take items five, six and seven in private? Agreed. Thank you. Um, item two, section 23 report, NHS in Scotland 2013. Um, we have a report from the Auditor General and can I uh, invite the Auditor General, uh, Trisha Meldrum and Gillian Matthews to give evidence to the committee. Good morning. Thank you. Um, the NHS in Scotland plays a significant role in the lives and work of millions of people every day and it's essential that the service is able to meet the needs of the population and deliver good quality health care. Spending on the NHS accounts for about a third of the Scottish Government's total budget and my report today comments on the performance of the NHS in 2013-14 and on its future plans. The overall message is that the NHS in Scotland is facing significant pressures at the same time as needing to make major changes to services to meet future needs. We know that NHS boards are finding it increasingly difficult to cope with these pressures in a tightening financial situation. The report also comments on the increasing evidence of pinch points in the complex health and social care system, which can lead to delays in patients getting the care they need in hospital or the community. Some of these pinch points are shown in Exhibit 13 on page 40 of the report. We found that NHS boards in Scotland delivered a small surplus of £23.4 million against an overall budget of £11.1 billion in 2013-14. All NHS boards did meet their financial targets, but several boards required additional funding from the Scottish Government or relied on non-recurring savings to break even. Despite significant efforts, the NHS didn't meet some key waiting times targets in 2013-14. We consider that the current level of focus on meeting waiting time targets may not be sustainable when combined with the additional pressures of increasing demand, such as the growing older population and tightening budgets. We also highlight in the report that increasing numbers of people being, are being admitted to hospital from accident and emergency departments, rising numbers of delayed discharges and more demand for outpatient appointments are creating blockages in the system which add further pressure on services. NHS boards need a more detailed understanding of current and future patient demand, how they're using their capacity and how patients move through the system. This will help them assess how they can deliver services differently in the future to better match needs. The NHS has made good progress in improving outcomes for people with cancer or heart disease and reducing healthcare associated infections. But progress has been slow in moving more services into the community and further significant change is needed to meet the Scottish Government's ambitious 2020 vision for health and social care. It's clear that the NHS will not be able to continue to provide services in the way it currently does. We recognise that it will be challenging for the NHS to make the scale of changes required over the next few years, but critical if it's to meet the vision and the future needs of the population. We make a number of recommendations in the report. These focus on NHS boards working with their partners to develop clear plans about how they will deliver sustainable and affordable services in future, including how they will release and move funding to provide more services in the community. We also recommend that NHS boards and their partners use information to better understand where the blockages in the system are that lead to problems like people having to wait in hospital longer than they need to. Looking at the bigger picture, the NHS needs to take a step back and look at what it's trying to achieve and develop long-term clear plans for delivering sustainable and affordable services for the future. As part of this, we've recommended that the government reviews its performance framework to ensure the targets and measures for the NHS are consistent with and support its 2020 vision. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned that um, the waiting times targets may not be sustainable, and yet we know that the setting of targets has had a remarkable impact on service delivery. Um, we only need to think back 
um, some years ago to uh, the waiting times that, 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 that people used to have um, for treatments that are now seen as relatively routine uh, and treatments that can be done um, quickly. If you think that the targets may not be sustainable, and if it's accepted that targets have actually made a contribution in terms of improving uh, the service that, that, that patients have, what would be the solution? Um, I think it's important for us to be clear we're not saying targets aren't important and, and may not be useful. We know, for example, that waiting times matter to all of us and our family and friends in terms of knowing how quickly we'll be treated and making sure that we're treated as quickly as possible. What we're seeing, though, is that um, after a long period when, as you say, waiting times across the system have been coming down, that trend is starting to be reversed. And we've got particular concerns about increasing waits for outpatient appointments when people enter acute hospital care and delayed discharges when they're waiting to go home. And our concern is that the focus that people in the health service are putting on meeting those targets is making it harder to step back and look at how the, the acute system as a whole is working and how it fits into the wider system of health and social care. And our concern is that with the tight budgets that we know are likely to be in place for the foreseeable future and the growing no needs of older people, that um, balance may not be sustainable. So we're not saying do without the targets. We're saying make sure that they are achievable and moving the health service in the right direction. So w w which is the most critical factor, uh, increased demand for services or squeezed budgets? I think it's a combination of all of them, and it's not possible to um, pin down the, the sort of contribution that each of them makes. We know that um, the Scottish Government has protected the NHS revenue budget with slightly above in inflation increases um, year on year. We also know that healthcare costs tend to go up faster than general inflation, so that money is not going as far as it um, would do in other services. We know the population is getting older, and older people tend to have more complex needs for health care. Um, and we've got more challenging waiting times targets now. Um, we outline in the report how some of the targets have got tighter over the last few years. All of that together is contributing to the, this picture of increased pressure that we're painting today. When we look at Exhibit 5 on, on page 23, um, you see particular issues in, in some uh, health boards compared to, to others. You know, for example, um, in, in Grampian and in Greater Glasgow, um, there are a whole number of areas there where we actually see a deterioration or um, no improvement or just meeting uh, or just failing to meet um, the targets. Fourth Valley also has significant areas of concern. Um, are there specific reasons in, in those health board areas? Is it a management issue? Is it a budget issue? Uh, why, why them and, and not others? specific boards right across Scotland um, and that will always be the case but I think what I'd like to um, sort of draw out today is that sense that we believe the evidence is showing pressure on the health service right across Scotland. Um, you'll be looking later this morning at um, Section 22 reports on NHS Highland and NHS Orkney, which suggest that the pressures came out there particularly strongly in terms of the financial pressures. For the boards that you've highlighted on Exhibit 5, I think the pressures are coming out particularly in terms of their clinical performance and especially waiting times targets. Um, we highlight some other boards that have had an increasing focus on non-recurring services non-recurring savings or support from the Scottish Government to balance their budgets. One of the lessons we've learned over recent years is that it's risky to look at financial performance or service performance in isolation. You have to look at the picture in the round and all of that evidence suggests to us that there is increasing pressure in the system. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned at paragraph 48 that the NHS spent £128 million on bank and agency nursing and midwifery staff um, in 2013-14 which was an increase of 15%. Now, you know, that's a, a staggering uh, figure. And yet, at the same time, um, on page 28 at Exhibit 7, um, you show that the number of nursing and midwifery vacancies are rising. So there, there's an increase in vacancies. We're using more 
private staff, why can't we simply use some of those private staff to recruit them and fill the vacancies? I'll ask Trisha to come in in a moment. Um, in general terms, there will often be occasions when using um, temporary staff is a good thing because there are particular peaks in workload, um, long-term sickness absence that needs to be covered. And in those circumstances, in our view, using bank staff <laughs> is the preferred option. They tend to cost less than staff from private agencies and because they are on the hospital's own bank, they tend to know the hospital and its safety and quality procedures better. The, the question is um, why there is that overall pressure on nursing staffing and how it can best be managed. I, I understand that, but in, in paragraph 48, you also say that spending in agency staff increased by 46%, and that followed a rise of 62% in the previous year. So we're not talking about marginal and, and trivial changes here. We're talking about very substantial changes. Absolutely, and that's why we've drawn attention to it in the report. Um, it is both a pressure on the finances of the NHS to be spending more on agency staff in that way, and it brings additional risk to patient safety because they're less familiar. I'll ask Trisha to talk you through the background to it. The, the, general, the, the general direction prior to the past two years has been that, yeah, yes, we recognise there is a need for some flexibility around the nursing and midwifery staffing, um, and that has largely come through the bank staffing. So these are people who are already employed by boards who are already um, working there who can do some additional hours. That is seen as being the more efficient, the more effective, the safer option. Um, obviously, the bank has not been able to, to fully meet the needs going forward, so that's why we're seeing an increase in, in use of agency staffing. That can sometimes be in very specialist services, so where you wouldn't expect there to be um, bank staff available. So that can be an issue, but, but um, it is an indicator of, of some increasing um, demands and, and increasing pressures. Um, it's still a very small percentage of the overall spend, but we've highlighted it because of this change in the trend that, that reverses what's been happening in recent years. Okay, thank you. Mary Scanlon and then Colin Keir. Yeah, um, I just wonder if I could re return to uh, uh, IT. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've talked about IT... A huge amount on this committee, and it seems that lessons are never learned, but we're always told that the next time around it's all going to be fine. So I would refer to page 15, case study 3, NHS 24's future programme. Um, the NHS 24 is delayed implementation as it considers the new application developed doesn't meet patient safety. Um, so the original business case was £29.6 million. Uh, total cost to date is 38 million. You go on to say there's brokerage of 16.9, a further 0 0.8 in revenue, and a further 2.2 million. So, um, first of all, can you uh, can you tell us uh, the original business case was 29.6? How much is that costing at the moment? When is it likely to be finished? Have lessons been learned? And what's the final cost? And why has it gone so badly wrong? There's a limit to what I can say about that particular okay. case at the moment, Mrs Scanlon. Yeah, okay. could, could I just point out Post that there is a court case and, and, and some of this I may be sub judice, so um, I, I think we maybe need to bear with uh, the Auditor General in any careful <laughs> comments that she may make. Oh, well, it's on the record, but what, can we just flick over carefully from that one? I apologise, convener, okay. I wasn't aware of that. No, and, and we will be reporting more in due course when we're able to do that. Well, so. I think it's certainly worthy of further investigation, so I, I'll watch that carefully. Okay. I appreciate we're coming to NHS Highland next, convener, but it was just a point on non-recurring savings. Um, Fifteen years ago, NHS Highland were being told that they should not depend on non-recurring savings. That was 99 and 2000. We're in 2014, and they're not the only one. I, I mention it because page 17, Exhibit 3, you know, so many are dependent on non-recurring savings, obviously, apart from NHS Greater Glasgow and, uh, uh, to an extent, Forth Valley. So, <laughs> why is this still happening when it was a problem 15 years ago and nothing seems to change. 
It's, it's a concern for us across Scotland. Um, I think you're referring to Exhibit 3, and it does show that um, NHS boards across Scotland, to varying extents, are relying on non-recurring savings. They can be a useful way of balancing the budget in year, but they do add to the pressures on health boards in the longer term because those savings have to be found again in future years. And it's why we've been making the recommendations we have been about improving longer-term financial planning as well as in-year planning. Um, not only does it take the pressure off in future future years, but it also makes it more likely that the savings that are being made are helping to reshape the services for the medium term, rather than running the risk of making that more difficult by making cuts that are easy, but may, may well be making it harder to develop community-based services and new types of service for the future. Could you explain why NHS Highland are facing the pressures they've got? And I appreciate that's the next session. I, I would just like to return to Exhibit 5, um, page 23. Uh, I noticed that Grampian have not achieved any of their targets for this year, 2014, and Highland have only achieved two. But if we look at the outpatients within 12 weeks, no health board has achieved that. Five out of 14, the day case treatment time guarantee, five out of 14, A&E, and cancer urgent referral to first treatment, five out of 14. Uh, almost a third, delayed discharge, three out of 14. Um, so really what I'm saying, having watched these uh, reports annually, and you do say yourself that performance against some waiting targets deteriorated, are the waiting targets too stringent? Is the money simply not there? Or, you know, why is it that Things are getting worse rather than better. Is it a management problem? Is it a financial problem? Is it the way that we do things? Or, you know, every time we come to this, there's always a whole myriad of problems and they're all going to be sorted by next year. And next year we come along full of optimism and things have deteriorated again. So why... Uh, can you give us an idea of uh, the reasons why... Most health boards haven't achieved their targets, and I appreciate there are difficulties with Grampian and Highland because they do not receive their full national resource allocation. I think it's a combination of factors which applies across the health service but will apply in different um, degrees in individual wards. First of all, we know that finances are tight. The government has uh, protected NHS revenue budgets for the um, frontline delivering boards with increases that are slightly above inflation, but healthcare inflation tends to be higher than that. Um, we know that the population is getting older, so there are more older people who tend to have more complex needs, who um, need more support to be discharged from hospital once they've been admitted. Um, and we've got particular financial pressures in some boards, like those that are below their um, national resource allocation, uh, uh, allocation, the funding uh, target for them, which adds to the challenges in those boards. You can see, though, by looking across the table, that um, some boards are managing better than others, and we've talked before about examples of the way services are being delivered and redesigned that can help to manage those pressures at a local level. The NHS as a whole is doing some work to improve its understanding of patient flows and what the pinch points are. We also know that some of the targets have got more stringent over the last few years, and it's why we're suggesting it's time to take a step back and make sure that the balance of the targets, the funding available, and the longer-term um, vision to reshape the healthcare is all in the right place to be able to work effectively, rather than running the risk of inefficiency by focusing on an individual target at the expense of the bigger picture. Certainly, looking at this report, it, uh, this report, it's doesn't seem to be progressing, but let's hope the longer term. My, my final point, um, I thought Exhibit 13, page 40, was quite interesting, and it's really about digging below the figures, and quite a few figures stepped out, but I'm sure my other colleagues will raise issues there. But probably, um, it's sort of bottom right in one of the red boxes, 4,200% uh, increase in the number waiting for more than 12 weeks. Now, you know, we would always like to think that uh, the focus is on clinical need rather than meeting targets. But to me, what that's saying is that more and more people are having to, to wait more than 12 weeks and perhaps 
just being treated below the day of the target in order to come in under the target. That is a huge increase. Does that mean that regardless of your, well, putting words in your mouth, but it would appear to me that regardless of clinical need, more and more people are having to wait for the target to kick in rather than being treated uh, on, on the basis of their need. 4,200% within a year is uh, one of the highest figures I've ever seen as far as a change within one year is concerned. Uh, am I misunderstanding this or could you explain it um, and clarify I'll, it? We can do and I'll ask yeah. Gillian to come in in a minute on that specific yeah. point on the exhibit. Um, but more generally, what we're trying to do is to make sure we understand and to... That's okay. <laughs> Yeah. One year, yeah. Um, is to try to make sure we understand the way this complex system works in practice. Because um, we know that some targets are being met by most boards, not all of them. But we're seeing these um, warning signs, signs of pressure building up for outpatients waiting for their first appointment and delayed discharges of people waiting to leave hospital safety at, safely at the end of it. Um, the convener asked earlier whether um, the targets were a good thing or a bad thing, and the answer, of course, is that they're both. It does matter to all of us that we're seen as quickly as possible and that we've got some certainty about it. Indeed, but equally having a target which um, is unachievable so that people's efforts are simply on meeting the target r rather than on making sure the whole system can work smoothly isn't helpful. So what we've tried to do here is to identify where those pinch points are, where there appears to be real pressure in the system and where the risks of that sort of um, managing to the target may be higher than they would be elsewhere where a system's running in steady state. Um, and I'll ask Gillian to pick up the specifics of what ha what's happening with, with that particular part of it next would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, the figure that you're referring to there is specifically around um, outpatient um, waiting times for the 12 weeks. So um, on page 24, we sort of lay out some of the figures around what's happening there. Um, and the number of people waiting is increasing at much higher rates than the number of people that are being seen. But this is sort of going back to the overall increasing demand from um, various issues around ageing population, more people with long-term conditions. Um, but the Exhibit 13, as Auditor General was saying, we were trying to kind of show overall where some of the main pressures are for the NHS. So outpatients was one of those, along with delayed discharges and um, sort of increasing numbers being admitted from AD, um, especially around older people. So I think... Outpatients is one of the areas where we are seeing sort of the, the pressures, but um, what boards are doing are trying to look at, I think in the past, we would have looked at separate areas, looked at a &E, looked at what was happening outpatients, but now they're starting to look at um, the whole system, if you like. So there's, there's work going around um, with the government supporting some boards, they're piloting um, a new approach to look at the whole system, look at how the um, patient flows, look at how... Um, what's happening in A&E, what, what impact that has on inpatients, what impact that has on outpatients, and then also on community care as well, and how that's all joined up. So that's quite early work, but um, there's quite a lot going on around trying to understand yes. that better. Thank you. That was my previous question, Convener, and, and the fact was I did, I did see no board met its outpatient target. Um, but So uh, am I right in saying that in March 2010... We're comparing that to March 2014. So in March 2010, am I right in saying that 157 patients waited more than 12 weeks? And in March 2014, 6,754 patients waited more than 12 weeks. So, you know, I mean, everyone going for a hip operation, let's say, they've all got different levels of pain and different levels of need. Does it appear that clinical need is being surpassed for targets because you know more people are waiting you know more people are waiting more than twelve weeks significantly more four thousand two hundred percent more uh, is there a distortion There's, there was always we all agree that targets nobody wants to go back to waiting two years for orthopedic surgery that, that no one at all um 
But at the same time, we don't want the urgent cases all being lumped in with the 18-week target. And this seems to me to be the first indication that I've seen that everyone, regardless of need, uh, has to wait more than 12 weeks. We haven't Am found... I interpreting that wrongly? N no, but we haven't found evidence that people are being... Um, manage to the target and for example people with less need are being seen sooner than people with greater need just because of the target. What we are seeing though is that increase in the number of people waiting more than 12 weeks still relatively small numbers if you compare it to the 350,000 or so people being seen in outpatients each year but going up markedly and as Gillian said within that we're seeing more, more people being added to the outpatient waiting list than we are people being taken off it so at the moment the trend is for that to keep on increasing and that's the pinch point that we w wanted to identify in the report as being one of the signs of the system being under pressure. It may be that the 12 week waiting time itself isn't quite right, it may be that the targets for treatment after that could be adjusted. What we think the government needs to do is to take that step back and say how do we get the system in balance and how do we make sure that the targets we're setting are helping us to reshape the service for the 2020 vision rather than making it harder as we think is the risk at the moment agree that it is a significant increase. It certainly is. Okay, thank you. Colin Keir. Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, just actually on that, in terms of we're getting the percentages, the amounts, what's the total through number uh, in terms of uh, the service, uh, the likes of outpatients, that we can get an idea of exactly how, uh, how many people out of the total uh, yep. are actually failing on their target? Sure. The number of outpatient, new outpatients seen during 2013-14 was 367,259. So as I say, the number of people waiting more than 12 weeks is a relatively small number um, at 6,754, but it is increasing um, and the current trend is that it will continue to increase. Yeah, just to try and get a perspective yeah. in terms of the number. Absolutely. Although the percentage rise and there may um, well be a trend we, you know, that you may have identified, I'm trying mm -hmm. to just explain that in terms of the the total amount going into the system, yeah. it's still a relatively small number at this point. Absolutely. As I say, it's about 6,750 people out of 367,000 yeah. new appointments, but the trend is upwards. Uh -huh. actually takes me back to the use of bank staff that was asked by the uh, convener earlier on about the, um, the issue of uh, bank staff and, of course, uh, private staff. And in terms of the total numbers uh, that are taken in, I'm assuming that this is a, a, a very low number in terms of the total staffing of the health service, but the uh, actually the showing that it's not, shall we say for the sake of argument, a, a privatisation menu, if you like, uh, simply because of the fact that it's more looking after the pressures that are um, being faced at this minute in time. So it's not a policy decision to move away to the using private or bank staff on a permanent basis for a service. No, I think as Tricia said, um, the amount spent on bank and agency nurse of £128 million last year is relatively small in the overall spend on the NHS and in the evidence available to us suggests that it, it's meeting short-term needs for staffing um, in different health services. Could I just go to my the question I, had, I actually had, and it was something that's come up over uh, the past uh, couple of weeks in various uh, places, certainly in your report uh, that claims that the, uh, in terms of the reducing Westminster budgets, that's seen a 10% reduction in Scotland's overall fiscal budget, the cash revenue capital combined between 2010, 11 and 2015. This meant a capital cut well in excess of 20%. As the Scottish Government is using NPD and the HUB programmes to ensure the investment in the NHS infrastructure uh, is, um, is carried on, uh, would you consider the equivalent capital value in future NHS budget assessments? Um, the, what this report is looking at is the amount which is, is the information that comes out of the audits of all of the NHS boards for last year. Um, you might recall that we reported last year um, on a wider basis across the Scottish budget about the importance of um, in, in 
improving and increasing the transparency, particularly about that sort of revenue financed investment, um, that we know that the capital budget is decreasing and for the, the known planning period will um, be reduced. The government is, for understandable reasons, investing financing in other ways through the NPD and other models and is using the new borrowing powers or is planning to use the new borrowing powers it has under the Scotland Act. All of that are entirely appropriate policy choices for any government to make. Um, but in my view, the transparency of that spending, what we're getting for it and what the long-term revenue commitment is, is important to enable the Parliament um, to understand the uh, context of the financial decision-making they're doing and the choices that that involves for the longer term. Yeah, it was just in terms of keeping a, a broad perspective in the way yeah. where the government is trying to deal with the problems of mm -hmm. um, diminishing capital uh, yeah. investment. But and we've, we've tried to give as much information as we can about both the revenue and capital budgets and outturns here. Um, I think we saw a further announcement just in the last few days about new health service investment coming from the NPD model. Um, clearly that's not included here, um, but as it comes through the NHS accounts, it will be in future. So that would be something you would put into this sort of report in the future? Yeah, if it, okay. as it comes through the NHS accounts, it's always included. Okay. Colin Beatty. Um, I'm looking at page 16, uh, paragraph 13 at the top of the page there, and we're talking about the, the allocation of funding. Now, the Scottish Government's aiming for all NH NH boards to be within 1% of their allocations by 2016-17, which isn't very far away. And I'm looking at where we are at the moment with the four uh, bodies that are currently below their target allocations, there are obviously two of them are featuring today as, a, as an issue on funding. Is it a realistic target? Is it, I'm looking here at NHS uh, Highland and NHS Lanarkshire, it seemed to be going the wrong way. Um, is there a plan? Have you seen the plan? Uh, the, the plan, as we understand it, is for each board to be within 1% of its allocation by 2016-17. Um, as background, the formula has been in place since 2009-10, and it takes account of the makeup of the population, levels of deprivation and other health needs, and the costs of providing services in remote and rural areas. Um, and the intention is that each board should be funded on that basis by 2016-17. At the same time, we know the government has um, made an explicit um, uh, de declaration of policy that in moving towards it, it doesn't want to destabilise individual health boards, particularly those who would lose by having money moved away from them. It's a way of allocating the overall NHS pot, not of providing more money to the boards which are currently below their formula. Um, so um, our understanding is that the policy intention is in place. We have seen some additional funding to Grampian, I think, in recent months um, to help them move forward more quickly, recognising the particular clinical challenges they've been facing. Um, but I think in broad terms, it's a policy decision for government about how quickly they move towards it and what exceptions they might make in either direction for particular boards. So just to be clear, this, the, this, these funds, and there's quite a bit of money there, has to move from other parts of the National Health Service in order to achieve that? Yes, it's a way of allocating the overall NHS budget, yeah. not of adding new money into the system. OK. Uh, turning to page 29, um, Talks been, there's been some talk about the bank nurses and so on. The last, on paragraph 48, the very last sentence there, agency staff are likely to be more expensive than bank nurses and also pose a greater potential risk to patient safety and the quality of care. Why? It's because bank nurses are employed by the local um, NHS hospital or system. Um, they're on the bank on a permanent basis so that you have the chance for proper induction, for continuing training and development, and for them to build up their awareness of things like the crash procedure if somebody has a heart attack on a ward, or the way things are done to maintain drug safety on ward rounds. Agency staff are employed by a private agency. They tend to be um, used for shorter periods of time and um, in, in different areas areas of the health service so they don't have the opportunity either to be trained and inducted in the same way or to build up their own experience of the way the system works. Um, it's a broad professional consensus that where possible bank agency, sorry bank staff are both cheaper and prov can provide a better quality of care. There may be occasions when agency staff are needed but they should be um, a last resort when you can't fill your needs from bank staff. Obviously agency staff are being increasingly used you're saying here 46% increase. 
um, surely they're trained up to the same standards as uh, NHS staff. Surely it's in the interest of the agencies to ensure that they are trained in NHS procedures. I'm, I'm just concerned about this thing about patient risk. No, you're absolutely right. They, the, the staff would be trained to the same standards as nursing staff right across Scotland. Um, and a good agency has every incentive to make sure that it invests in professional development for its own staff. It really is that familiarity with the way things work around here, with this hospital, um, this specialty and this ward, um, and the ability to build up that experience of simply knowing where the drug cart is, what the processes are, um, the other members of the team, which we also know are important elements of the quality of care for patients. It's that familiarity more than anything that makes a difference. It's to do with the skills of the agency nurses that are being employed. No. It's, to, it's to do with the, the short-termism of their, of their attachment and the potential unfamiliarity with the particular area that they're <coughs> physically working in. That's right. Okay. Just uh, thank page... See, just before you move on from that, um, can I clarify you, your reference to the evidence for that? Um, is that the report from 2010 using locum doctors and hospitals? Yes, it is. Yep. And we've done previous work on bank and agency nurses further, further back than that. So we've been building our expertise in that area over a long period right. so, of time. So there is some evidence in relation to... Nursing staff absolutely. as well as doctors. Yes, very yeah, much so. Thank you. Um, turning to page 33, paragraph 59, um, pensions, which have obviously come up before, and public sector pensions, of course, are quite a big issue because I think uh, almost every area is running a, a deficit. Um, you, don't, you haven't actually quantified any deficit in the NHS. Um, do you intend to do any work in relation to public sector pensions at some point in the future? Yes, we haven't quantified the deficit in this report because we've been focusing on changes and future pressures. We have reported a couple of times on um, NHS and public sector pension schemes more widely. Um, one of the challenges for the NHS scheme is that it's not a funded scheme. So there's a large liability, but there isn't an asset against which to match it. Um, so the challenge is making sure that that liability is understood um, and that the um, long-term cost implications of it are also being factored into long-term financial planning. Um, there are moves across the UK to be making changes to pension schemes, both to the, the way the costs and benefits are shared and to the way they're funded, to make them more sustainable in the long term. But it's currently an unfunded scheme, um, and these are the things which are changing the pressures that health boards face. An unfunded scheme, that's... Yeah. Would, would, that, would that mean... I mean, there's no pension pot. Right. Quite simply. So pensions are paid out of revenue. Yes. That's quite a big liability. That it, it is, and it's the case for um, most of the public sector schemes apart from the yeah. local government one. The local government superannuation scheme is the only one where there are where there is a pension pot to match the liabilities. All of the others are paid from revenue, um, and it's why we've reported in the past about the way the overall liability is being managed and why we focused here on the way um, in which the costs of meeting that liability are increasing because of known changes coming through. I realise this is a UK-wide issue. Mm. Um, did you, did you say when you were thinking of doing the next review of public sector pension liabilities? It's something we keep under review all the time because it is so significant. Um, we are likely to include some information on it in our next report on developing financial reporting that's due in the new year. I haven't made a decision on doing another in-depth look at pensions, but it may well come up in the programme in the next couple of years. Uh, Ken McIntosh and then James Nordland. Uh, thank you, Nina. Um, thank you, Auditor General. There's a, a number of um, sort of worrying uh, report, comments in your report. Uh, am I right in thinking that uh, there has been a reduction of about 2,000 2, fewer beds over the last four years in our health service? Um, I think uh, that number sounds right, and I'll ask colleagues to keep me right on the detail. We have reported to you before that a large part of that decrease is because of the move from um, very much surgery being provided on a, an inpatient basis to day surgery. Um, so there has been a decrease, but um, it, it's not the same impact as it might appear on first impressions. OK, so but there's two things. You, well, you, you say that people are moving away from inpatient, but then you also point out to a, 
a, a quite a huge increase in outpatient, that no one's meeting their outpatient targets. And in fact, out, outpatient waiting lists have increased from 187,000 to 250, more than 250,000. As I've said earlier in evidence, it's, it's clear that one of the pinch points in the system is um, the uh, time that people are waiting for outpatient appointments. Um, part of that is to do with the fact that as a population we're ageing and older people tend to have uh, more complex health needs, make more call on the health service. Um, and that's one of the pressures that we think un underlies the challenges that health boards are facing in, in balancing their budgets, meeting targets and reshaping services for the future. But I'm just thinking, but the fewer beds and outpatient waiting lists are getting along at the same time. And, and you also, uh, you also highlight there's. Uh, can, can I ask first of all, actually, just on that, are, are the government actually addressing these issues? I mean, do you detect that there are initiatives in place to address these particular problems? I think we say in part two of the report quite a lot about what the government and individual health boards are, are doing to try to manage them. Um, so we mentioned the quest work that's being done with Forth Valley and some other boards to really understand the flows of patients, where their pinch points are and how they can manage them. So there is work going on. Um, my concern in this report is to say, even with that work, it feels to us that the combination of the tight budgets we know we face, higher healthcare inflation, an ageing population and tight waiting times targets are making it harder to reshape services in the way they need to be developed for the future. Um, so there is work going on. It's the question about whether the big picture is sustainable as it currently stands. Yes, I'll, I'll return to that in a minute. But uh, so, well, are the government aware, or are they doing anything about the fact that outpatient waiting times are, are rising? Yes, we say in the report that there are considerable efforts going on right across the NHS to manage individual waiting times targets, the broader heat targets, which don't focus just on waiting times, and um, the, to meet the financial targets. A huge amount of effort is going into that at health board level and at the government. Um, the, the challenge is, um, first of all, whether that's possible, and particularly whether it's possible to do that while making quite significant changes to, to move more services into the community to help us all live longer, healthier lives at home. Um, and, and our concern is that the uh, focus on short-term targets is making that harder. Yes, but I mean, pardon me if I get this wrong, but I'd have thought that outpatient activity would increase if we're, if we're moving to a different model away from inpatient care, and you've pointed out that 2,000 fewer inpatient beds, so moving to more outpatient care, and yet the government <coughs> is supposed to be addressing this, and yet it's, it's, it's missing all, every, every single board is missing its target here. Are, why is it getting it so wrong here? I think the answer is that it's very complex. Um, there are more new outpatients being seen. Uh, the number of outpatients rose from about 324,000 um, in the previous year to 367,000, uh, sorry, over three years. So they've gone up quite markedly over that three-year period. But the number of people looking for outpatient appointments has gone up faster. And that's why we're seeing the increase in the number of people waiting and waiting for more than 12 weeks. The number waiting more than 12 weeks is still quite small, but the trend's in the wrong direction. And the, the challenge is not just to meet the outpatient target, but to develop the whole system so that people can be seen in outpatient, can receive the treatment they need, whether that's inpatient or day case, can be discharged safely home, and at the same time be reshaping services across the piece. It's a complicated thing. It would be hard to do in any circumstances, but when budgets are tight, it's that much harder. Tricia, please. Just to, to add, um, the Quest team that we talked about, they also have um, quite significant programmes of work around supporting changes and redesigning outpatient services. The case study that's on page 25 around fracture clinics, that's one of the examples of how they're trying to avoid people having to go to outpatient clinics to, to release some of that capacity. We also know there's quite a big drive towards increasing use of telehealth, telecare, things like that, that again avoid people having to come into hospital in the first place. So there are quite a number of programmes of work um, aimed at, at trying to reduce some of that pressure. And, and uh, one of those pressures that you also identified is, is a delayed discharge or, or bed blocking, as it's been called in the past. Bed blocking has been around for a long time now. And yet you, you're seeing in the report that uh, it's actually increased over the last five years. This is despite the su supposed political and government attention is getting is increasing. 
Yeah, delayed discharges came down for a period of time and now that trend's going in the wrong direction again. Um, and once more, we think it's one of these signs of the pressure on the system, um, that for people to be discharged quickly from hospital, that needs to be done in a safe way. They need to be able to get the things um, in hospital right. And there also needs to be an assessment of what services they need in the community and those services to be available. This report focuses on the NHS, but we know from previous work that uh, local government social care budgets are also under pressure at the same time, again, that the population of older people is increasing. Um, so the system as a whole is under pressure, and it's uh, that the outpatients uh, waiting times for people coming in, delayed discharges for people leaving the health service, both show the same picture of increasing pressure. You're not making me feel any better here. <laughs> and I think it's important to say there are no easy answers to this. It's, mm. it's why we think that step back to say, how do you best balance what matters to people about waiting times and access to services, um, the money that is available for spending on the NHS against the other services that we all rely on, and the bigger picture of an ageing population that needs, needs different services. That's a difficult set of choices for us to make as a society, and there isn't a magic wand that will make it right. I think, but I think you point out delayed discharge actually costs £78 million, pounds. Yeah. is that right? Um, I don't have the figure to hand, colleagues will do, yes that's the figure in the report um, and it, it's one of those classic examples where things going wrong in the system now not only make things harder for patients but also tend to cost more money, the challenge is how you break out of that system mm. um, and we think the answer is to step back a bit, um, look at whether the individual short term targets are right and whether they're really helping us to make the moves we need to make towards the 2020 vision mm. yeah, no, I think you're, you're painting a very vivid picture of hard-pressed staff working their utmost to address short-term problems or immediate urgent problems but actually the whole serf, health, whole health service and, and care generally um, creaking under the strain of, of demand and not enough resources. It, we know that the short-term targets are there for good reasons and waiting times targets matter to all of us. Mm. The question we're asking is about whether all of those are in balance and whether with the funding that's available, the, the milestones that the government has set towards 2020 are likely to get us there. Um, at the moment, there are clearly signs of pressure in the system, both financially and in terms of waiting times. And it's that step back and looking at what will help us to ease the immediate pressure so we can invest in, this, in change on the scale that's needed is the question I'm asking in this report. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of other milestones. I think you've pointed out that the, the high risk backlog of capital maintenance, uh, the government was supposed to uh, um, get rid of all high risk maintenance by this year and it's failed to do so. And I think it was supposed to reduce its significant risk maintenance backlog by 2016. And again, you're suggesting that it's going to fail to do so quite dramatically. The, the figures, as you say, show that the um, backlog maintenance estimated cost has increased and it will take longer than expected to clear the high-risk um, backlog. Um, I don't think that's surprising in the context of the financial pressures we're talking about, but it is another pressure that has to be taken into account in setting the financial and performance targets for the health service and thinking about what investment is needed for the longer term. Um, it may be that um, some of the models of hospital, we've, hospital care we've got in some parts of Scotland aren't right for the future, and that all needs to be played into that estimate of what the cost is and what the priority should be for spending. I thought the, just on a, on a slightly cheerier note, if you can add that, I thought the, 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 the graph that gave me greatest hope in this whole book was page 34. And that's, uh, as far as I can see, we're all going to live forever, according to your... Is, it, is that right? Um, the, the changes in life expectancy are really quite startling at the moment. The, the, the life expectancy for a baby born today is decades longer than it was when, when we were born, making assumptions about our relative ages. Um, and it's changing year on year. If you look at the um, Registers of Scotland estimates, the um, G. Uh, the General Register Office estimates, they're, they're changing very fast. Um, and that's a huge success story. We should all be proud of it and individually pleased by it. But it does bring with it costs. We know that older people tend to have, they, we become frail, whatever happens, we have more complex health needs. And we need different health services from 20-year-olds who are at risk of breaking a leg or um, being injured in um, some other sort of accident. And that's why this is so important. It, it really is at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. I just, I, well, it's a great... Very encouraging. The previous page, unfortunately, points out that health 
the health budget is going to fall by 1% over the next two years. And um, we know right across um, Scotland and right across the United K Kingdom that um, the finances will stay tight for the, the foreseeable future. Um, I think that's the case, whatever scenario you might look at um, over the next period. And the challenge is to think through how we can manage those competing pressures. We've got the ageing population, we've got tight public finances, healthcare inflation will continue to be higher. Um, all of those things mean that these, these questions aren't going to go away and there is no quick fix for them. I think it's something that as a society we need to be um, able to, to debate and make choices about. And so the key thing is I think, not to be short term, but to try and look at the bigger picture. That's the that's uh, your key message here. Yes, we've been talking about long term financial planning for a while, and I think that's part of the key. The second is to make sure that we understand the impact that the short term financial and performance targets that are in place, for good reason, are helping with that long term picture rather than making it harder. Um, I'd like to go back to the point that was uh, raised by Mary Scanlon because I think that kind of says in a nutshell a, a lot of the pressures that we're already talking about. Mary quite rightly points out that the, there has been an increase in people waiting to be seen. But at the same time, there is a 13% increase of those who, had already, who are, have went through the system in that period, which suggests that the Scottish Government or the health service are looking at taking us very seriously, are dealing with more and more people every day. And the other side of it, the, the increase in those waiting showed that the pressures, the continuing pressures that we are under over an ageing population and, of course, the ongoing financial situation. Targets are coming up time and time again. Almost every questioner has asked you about targets. Would you think, and this is probably more a question for the committee as a whole, but do you think there's a case for the Scottish Government to come and explain to us the rationale behind their targets, why they select certain targets, and what, what the, you know what the judgment is for them to uh, put those targets forward. I, I think that would be a really helpful conversation to have. Um, I recall the evidence session you had with Scottish Government colleagues a few weeks ago about A&E waiting times, where they were very clear that the four-hour target for A&E is a good target because seeing people more quickly keeps the system moving and leads to better outcomes for those patients. There's always a judgment to be made, um, but we know that a number of targets elsewhere in the system have got tighter over recent years. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that debate's been had about whether the 18-week um, referral to treatment time is the right period and how it fits with outpatient targets and delayed discharges, but that sense of the whole system and the way in which targets play into that I think is a re really important discussion for the committee to have. Right, thank you for that. The, the, the Ken McIntosh talked about the... the no short-termism uh, and surely that's what 2020 vision is all about it's about looking at things in the round and it's about trying to make sure that we get there at the same time as, as we're dealing with and we have to deal with short-term issues because every short-term issue is a person with a problem but again i would say that we as a, have a responsibility to make sure that along with health professionals that this is not easy for any of us but that sometimes we put away our political hats and look at the, the, the picture in the round. Is there anything that, that uh, as Auditor General, that you've picked up while you're doing this report that you would suggest would be crucial or helpful to put in the mix for these sort of discussions that we should be having? I think you, you've already put your finger on it, Mr Dillon, and I think for us there are good reasons for having annual or short-term targets for the finances and for performance. Um, making sure that all of those fit together in the system in the year is, is one important question, and then making sure that all of them are moving us towards the 2020 vision rather than making it harder is the second question. My concern is that both of those look to me that they are um, getting more difficult for health boards than the government to achieve because of external pressures like the rate at which we are all um, getting older and living longer. Um, and I think just taking that step back and saying, is this moving us in the right direction towards the 2020 vision that, that garners really widespread support right across the piece would, would be a very um, important contribution for the committee to make. Okay, thank you for that. The only thing I would say is the older I get, the happier I am with that uh, graph that Ken pointed out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> In thought. I'll be. Um, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Convener, um, hello, Auditor General. You've mentioned several times um, that the Scottish Government has protected uh, in real terms the revenue budget, um, and there's evidence to support that. And 
there are good messages in your report too. There's, there's plenty of good messages about outcomes are improving in cancer, heart disease, health associated infections, uh, and patient satisfaction is increasing too. But you do say in page 32, Auditor General, that the forecast though for spending from the UK to Scotland is going to reduce, we're going to expect it to reduce by 0.7% in 2016 and 2017-18. Is there a quantifiable amount of money associated with those reductions? And are those compounded reductions? Is it 0.7 on top of another 0.7 in the second of those years? We show the cumulative percentage reduction on the right-hand part of, of that chart. Um, and I think that's the 0.93% reduction overall that's shown on the exhibit. We certainly can put a figure on it. I'm not sure we've got it with us just now um, to be able to give it to you, but we can provide that information. The, the point of this really is just to give that sense that um, the financial pressures are going to increase um, whatever decisions government and the parliament make about funding for the health service within Scotland. Uh, so so what, what we can see, though, in, in, in terms of a discussion about around targets, though, is, is there any evidence that you can find that failure to make a particular target in a particular health board, is it having any consequential impact at all on health outcomes or patient satisfaction? Is there any support? Is there any evidence to support that at the moment? We don't have evidence of it, but I think it would be a useful area to explore with government. First of all, we know that for any of us, um, not being seen within the time we expect to be seen is a disappointment. We want to be treated as quickly as we can, um, and we want to have some certainty about that because it helps us make plans for the rest of our lives. So people missing targets has an impact there. We know there are some conditions where it does have an impact, either because a condition gets worse or for things like hip replacement or knee replacement because people are living with discomfort for longer than they otherwise should. Um, there are some areas where it, it may not make very much difference other than the inconvenience around it. Um, and uh, the, the bigger question, I think, is the way individual targets fit together. So having a very short um, uh, target for outpatients um, followed by a longer period for treatment may make less sense than having a longer period for outpatients and then a quick follow-up. That's a, really a policy decision and a clinical decision rather than one for us. But the targets need to fit together through the system because a lot of this is about, about patient flow. Um, I think it goes back to Mr Dornan's question about time to have that debate. My sense is that people right across Scotland know there are some difficult choices to make here because of all the pressures on the health service and um, people don't expect everything to happen instantly. Having a public discussion about what matters most and how we balance the different priorities we've got seems to me a very timely um, move to, to make from this committee. I mean, uh, we do know from other data that patient satisfaction is higher than it has been for a number of years and that overall waiting times are lower. So I suppose my question to you is that uh, wh where are the opportunities perhaps as, for us as an audit committee again for the greatest gains to be made given that we're listening to your message about the significant pressures in the health service. Where are the chances and the opportunities for us for greater gains? Is it to look at these targets? I mean if there's no evidence to support at the moment that failure to meet a particular target is having any consequential impact on health outcomes. Should we be looking at the targets in a bit more detail, do you think? Is that where we might gain most? I, I think looking at the individual targets and the way they fit together, looking at the clinical evidence, looking at the evidence about what matters to people and asking people are all things that could really help move that debate along. Um, my sense is that people might well be prepared to wait a bit longer if they were sure that they would be seen within the time that was being set and that might help the whole system to run more smoothly that would let people divert their attention to thinking about the longer term changes that are needed rather than firefighting. Tricia, I think, wants to add to that. Just to add, thinking about some of the pressures, some of them are manifest in areas that are not particularly covered by targets as well. So if we think about inpatients, one of the issues that we've raised in the report is around boarding. So about patients being um, managed in not, not necessarily the correct ward, so a ward of a different specialty. And we know that that can have a detrimental effect on the patient experience, patient outcomes, length of stay. So, so some of the pressures are not necessarily targeted come through in the targets, but they do come through in other indicators. Yeah, and my, my last point, convener, again, Auditor General, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks about the slow progress in delivering health in the community setting and so on, and we've said it several times at, at previous committees. Um, 
are you getting a sense that they were making progress here, or is there, a, is there much more work to be done to, to, to affect some real real gains in this area that, that would influence a future report like this coming to this committee? We reported on that issue on reshaping care for older people back in June of this year, I think, um, and our finding then was that it was slow, efforts being made, but I think increasing evidence from this report that those efforts are made harder by the need to, to keep the system running in the short term to meet short-term financial and performance targets. We think that um, taking that step back and looking at the system as a whole will both make acute hospitals run more smoothly for everyone involved, health service staff as well as patients, but also provide that bit of breathing space, the money, the time to think about how you really do reshape services for the longer term. So it seems to us this is a really important debate to be having and to be thinking about how best to move us to where we need to be with the 2020 vision. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, can I thank the other third general and their colleagues for... Oh, sorry, Mary Scanlon. Sorry, it was just a very brief question. <coughs> uh, several of... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, several colleagues have mentioned uh, the, the ageing population, as you have, Auditor General. And it was just uh, page 40, exhibit 13. Um, Given the ageing population and the need for home care, etc., uh, I have to say I was just a little bit surprised that um, uh, care homes are down by 10%. Uh, there's 36,500 fewer residents in care homes, uh, but also care at home, which we, you know, we always understood there would be much more personal care delivered at home, and that's down by 11%. I think I'm right in saying that this is over the past five years. Um, but it's still a significant number, 60,950 60, fewer people uh, receiving home care. Uh, I just assume that, given everything we know about demography, that uh, you know there would be an increase in care homes, an increase in care home places, and indeed a significant increase in home care. It's going in the opposite direction. I don't understand that. I think there are two things going on there in broad terms. One is that um, care homes are increasingly recognised as not being the best place for many older people, that if, if we can stay at home for, for longer and live a good quality of life, we should be doing that. And I think that accounts for some of the fall in both the number of care homes and the people who live in them. The um, care at home figures seem to reflect um, higher thresholds from local authorities, that people who might have received an hour or two of help a week in the past increasingly won't qualify for um, social care at home, and care is being focused on people with more complex needs who really need that help to keep them at home. But again, I think it's another sign of the, the pressure on the system. And we know that the 2020 vision will require a much wider range of services that can provide much more flexible and responsive su support to older people and keep up with those needs as they change, as people get older and frailer. The, basically, the eligibility criteria for free personal care, and we were both on the committee that passed that in the first session of Parliament. So what you're saying is the eligibility criteria has increased and that uh, in order to get care at home, you have to have far greater needs than you did, say, 10 years ago. It's not just about free personal care, but all social well, care. all home but, care, but yes. Yes, that there's more of a focus on people with, with more serious and complex needs than was the case in the past. David Torrance, I believe, wants to come in. Thank you for being here. Uh, page 17 and to do a backlog of maintenance, mm. Fife has the largest increase, I think it's 13.5 million. Is that because recently, over the last year, um, they've moved to a new uh, extension in the hospital and there's a large number of uh, buildings surplus to requirements in Fife now, which have been uh, vacant for over a year now, if not longer? we can answer that specific question for you this morning. We do know that some of the increase is, is due to new um, backlog maintenance requirements being identified through surveys, but we can follow up on that with the committee in correspondence if that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank the Auditor General and her staff for a very uh, full contribution. This is clearly an issue of huge interest, not just to politicians, but to the public right across uh, Scotland and I don't think any of us would underestimate the not just the strains but the challenges that there are in delivering services and it's not just about party politics I think you've um, outlined very well um, the, the, the broad demographic and financial um, strains that are there so it's no doubt something we'll come back to so thank you very much for that.
Um, item three on our agenda, um, section 22 reports, um, the 2013 audit of NHS Highland and the 13-14 audit of NHS Orkney. Um, just before I get into it, can I also uh, just remind members that there was um, a section 22 report um, entitled the 2013-14 audit of NHS 24 management of an IT contract which was laid on Friday, October the 24th and it's not on the agenda. The reason for that is under Rule 7.5 7 of the Standing Orders on sub -judice. consideration of this report will be deferred until such time as any investigations are resolved. And that refers back to the yeah. earlier comments. Okay, thank you. So can I thank the Auditor General again, and this time she is joined by uh, Stephen Boyle, who's the Assistant Director of Audit Scotland, and Tricia Meldrum, the Senior Manager in Audit Scotland. Uh, and can I invite the Auditor General to speak to the two reports? Thank you, Convener. As you say, I'm bringing a further two reports to you this morning which highlight concerns in NHS Highlands and NHS Orkney and which were included as case studies in the report that we've just discussed. I've prepared these reports under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Act 2000. As you know, this legislation allows me to bring issues that have arisen from the audit of the accounts of public bodies to the attention of Parliament. I'd like to highlight at the outset that the external auditor, Stephen Boyle, gave unqualified opinions on the 2013-14 accounts of these organisations. This means that he's satisfied that the accounts do provide a true and fair view of the board's financial position. I've prepared reports on these boards because I believe that there are issues of concern highlighted in Stephen's report that should be brought to the attention of the Parliament through this committee. I'll cover the main issues in the two reports in turn. They both relate to weaknesses in financial management. As public sector budgets continue to tighten, effective financial management has never been more important, and it's fundamental in helping those in charge of governance to make informed decisions. In relation to NHS Highland, the auditor reported that weaknesses in financial management were a major factor in the board needing brokerage of £2.5 million from the Scottish Government in order to break even in 2013-14. This was mainly due to an overspend on the operating costs for Rig Moore Hospital, and the auditor highlight, highlighted that weaknesses in financial management at the hospital emerged late in the year. Other factors contributing to the need for brokerage were financial pressures in the acute sector from costs associated with hiring agency staff, especially locum doctors, and meeting national waiting times targets. The auditor also highlighted the board's continued reliance on non-recurring savings. Throughout the financial year, until February 2014, NHS Highland was forecasting that it would break even at the end of the financial year. Monthly reports throughout the year to its board of directors forecast a break-even position at the year end, although the actual outturn position showed significant overspends against the budget each month. There were no sufficiently detailed plans to bridge the gap between the board's in-year deficit position and its forecast break-even position. In February 2014, NHS Highland approached the Scottish Government to agree brokerage of £2.5 million to enable it to break even. Brokerage can be positive and give more flexibility if the Board and the Scottish Government plan for it appropriately as part of a clear financial strategy. In this case, however, the Board had to request it late in the financial year when it would have been unable to break even without that additional funding. Officers of the board didn't formally report this brokerage agreement to the board members until close, close to the end of the financial year. NHS Highland is due to repay the brokerage over the next three years. NHS Highland continues to experience financial pressures in 2014-15 and the auditor has reported that its financial position will remain challenging for the next five years. He's also highlighted that the cost of delivering adult social care services in Highland continues to pose a financial risk to the board. NHS Highland has put in place a new management team at Rigmore Hospital and training is being organised for all budget holders. A programme board has been set up to oversee the delivery of savings and the board is focusing on delivering savings to achieve financial balance. Moving on to NHS Orkney, weaknesses in financial management were again a factor in NHS Orkney requiring brokerage of £1 million from the Scottish Government to break even in 2013-14. The need for brokerage in this case was mainly due to hiring local locum doctors to cover vacant medical posts. The board continues to face difficulties in recruiting staff and this remains a cost pressure for them. 
The auditor also highlighted the board's continued reliance on non-recurring savings and concerns about the capacity of the finance team, given the financial pressures facing the board. Throughout the year, NHS Orkney was reporting an overspend against its revenue budget and continued to forecast that it would break even. However, like NHS, NHS Highland, it did not have detailed plans for how it was going to bridge the gap between its ongoing overspend position and the forecast break-even position at the end of the year, or provide reports to its board of directors about how it would achieve this. NHS Orkney approached the Scottish Government in February 14 to request brokerage of 0.75 million, which was later revised to £1 million in March 2014. The Chief Executive asked the Board's internal auditor to undertake a detailed review of the 2013-14 financial position, including its approach to budget setting and in-year financial management. This report was presented to the Board's Audit Committee in late September 2014, and the Board is currently developing an action plan. NHS Orkney still faces significant challenges in making the savings it needs to meet its financial targets. The Board has set out its plans to break even in 2014-15, but it continues to place a high reliance on non-recurring savings, which may not be sustainable in the longer term. As I said, alongside me today is Stephen Boyle, who is the appointed auditor for the, responsible for the audits of NHS Highland and NHS Orkney, and together with Tricia, we'll do our best to answer your questions, convener. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, you mentioned, uh, with reference to both reports, uh, weaknesses in financial management uh, in, in, in both boards. Are these the only boards in Scotland where there are weaknesses in financial management? They're certainly the most significant weaknesses that came out of the audit last year. Um, we were talking earlier about the financial and other pressures that face the NHS right across Scotland, and they're also a factor in these two cases. But in my view, financial management um, was not good enough in these two boards, which is why we're here today. You said that they were the most significant. Does that mean that other boards have weaknesses in financial management, but it's not as significant? Um, financial management varies across public bodies right across Scotland, um, and there are often uh, areas where there's room for improvement. These are the two in the health service where I felt the um, weaknesses were significant enough to merit bringing them here to the committee. You also identify for both boards... Um, problems, uh, costs associated with uh, hiring agency staff, uh, particularly locum doctors, um, but in the case of NHS Highland, presumably uh, other staff as well. Um, are there other boards in Scotland, you know, if I refer back to our previous discussion about the, the costs associated with this, are there other boards in Scotland where it's also a significant problem, but because of their finances, it doesn't impact on them so badly as these two boards. Are these two boards more exposed to this problem? I'll ask Stephen to come in in a moment. Um, I think my view is that they are more exposed to this problem because of where they are and the challenges that brings in providing services across very remote and rural areas. But the weaknesses in financial management made those um, pressures even more difficult for the boards to manage. Stephen, do you want to add to that? Thank you, Auditor General. Um, the experience um, we s saw in both um, Orkney and Highland, um, I guess, was twofold. It was the challenge in filling both the posts, but also um, a large increase in the early rates that they um, had to pay um, to secure the services of temporary members of staff during the year, and um, that contributed to both the, um, the um, significant increase in costs that both uh, health posts found during the year. Um, clearly, there are a number of factors um, behind that, um, and um, in Orkney in particular, um, it was noted that um, the organisation thought that they had secured um, key clinical posts, only to find that the successful candidate later changed their mind, which again contributed and compounded the, the financial challenges that they experienced. But that doesn't sound as though it's a problem that's likely to disappear any time soon. If there's a general shortage of staff in certain areas of specialism in the NHS across Scotland, and if these uh, areas are seen as less attractive to work for whatever reason, possibly because of uh, remoteness, then those who um, have the skills can drive the, the price. So is there any indication that uh, this problem won't reoccur 
you know, in future years? I think the indications are that it is a continuing pressure, especially for NHS Orkney. And it's probably worth noting that I think the committee heard from NHS Grampian a few weeks ago that for different reasons they face some of the same challenges um, in a part of Scotland that's got high costs of living. They're uh, struggling to recruit staff to fill key vacancies. So it's another financial pressure on the health service and one that does affect different parts of Scotland differently. Can you give me a significant example of non-recurring savings? Stephen, do you want to talk through your experience in either or both of the boards? Thank you, thank you, Auditor General. Um, perhaps the, the the best example of non-recurring savings um, is vacancy management convener. Um, so, in, in your previous question about the inability to fill a post um, during the period that that's uh, identified and the period that the the new post holder uh, takes up uh, their position. That gap would be an example of a non-recurring saving. Okay. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, um, Obviously, these don't make very happy reading. And uh, there's two things that I, I don't see coming out in the, in, in the reports. One is retribution and the other is resolution. Um, are the... Are the people who are responsible for this still in place? I see there's mention of uh, one of the heads of finance being replaced, but there must be other people who are responsible for this who failed to give the information that the board required. It's a serious failing. I think the Scottish Government is working closely with both boards, both to understand what went wrong and to resolve it. Um, Stephen might be able to give you more information about the, the specifics in each of the boards um, as it currently stands. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, if I can start with uh, NHS Orkney, um, I think it is safe to say that NHS Orkney is a small organisation, as our smallest territorial health board, and the uh, the demands on um, on that finance team um, are the same as really any other uh, territorial health board. Um, the nature of the the changes in that team were such that the head of finance uh, left uh, the organisation. Um, I think it was December 2013, and the organisation thought that it had sufficient capacity to deal with the requirements uh, that would be placed upon it in the intervening period. Um, perhaps the, what compounded the factor in NHS Orkney during the year was that um, they had to deal with the five-year um, revaluation of its land and buildings estate. Um, and during the course um, of that revaluation exercise, um, it was identified this was more complicated um, and more difficult than they had anticipated. Um, and indeed, um, the, um, as a result of that experience, um, the board then sought to um, review its uh, requirements again um, and has now appointed um, a replacement for that post um, of head of finance. So they are back to the level of finance capacity that they, uh, that they operated with. Um, um, in respect of NHS Highland, they are... Um, their financial management circumstances were such that they were compounded by the, um, the situation in Ragmore Hospital and the, the extent of its financial position um, only became clear um, later on in the financial year that prevented them from delivering the forecast break-even position that they had been doing so over the course of the financial year, uh, which then resul resulted in their requirement to seek um, brokerage funding from the Scottish Government. But uh, I don't get that feeling that it's really been taken a grip of as yet. Um, you may have more information on that. I mean, are you satisfied with the steps they're taking to bring all this under control? In terms of um, um, NHS Orkney, um, I think it's a, it's a positive step that they are back to a full complement um, of uh, finance professionals uh, in the team. I wouldn't say that that will guarantee their financial position or, uh, or um, alleviate the financial pressures uh, that they face, but I think it's a positive development that, um, that they now have the, the level of skills and expertise that they require. As a byproduct of um, their circumstances uh, during the, the audit of the financial statements, um, NHS Orkney forged strong links with uh, NHS Fife um, to allow them to deliver the, the conclusion of the financial accounts um, and, the, and the audit. So that may be a, 
a mechanism to allow them to draw on expertise as and when required going forward. Um, by way of um, NHS Highland, uh, NHS Highland has a, a, an experienced team that they have also in particular taken steps to um, address some of the financial uh, challenges uh, in Rigmore Hospital through the installation, as the Auditor General mentioned, of a new management team at the hospital, complemented by a programme board chaired by uh, their chief executives uh, to identify recurring savings to, again, secure their financial position in future years. I mean, these management failures are not just within the finance team. They're outside as well. There are other people responsible. I think um, the responsibility for governance and financial management is clearly an organisation-wide responsibility that rests formally with the board. Um, we've reported as clearly as we can the circumstances within both Orkney and Highland, and the circumstances are different there. But it, it is the board's responsibility to make sure it has the full picture in both of the finances and the performance of the board, and that it's applying appropriate challenge to that. Convener, it might be appropriate for us, we can't let this lie, I don't think, uh, it might be appropriate to ask the Scottish Government, maybe in writing to them, ask them to uh, give us more information on what steps have been taken since, they're cl since the Auditor General says they're closely involved in bringing this through. We, we, we'll be discussing that at item six okay. on the, the agenda. Thank you. Okay, j just before I bring Liam McArthur in, can I ask Mr Boyle, um, you mentioned the, the <coughs> Orkney um, had cooperated with NHS Fife to deliver some of the financial services. Um, is there any value in organisations like NHS Orkney actually pulling and sharing um, the delivery of certain services such as finance, personnel, IT with, uh, with other boards or is there a value in them retaining a standalone function? Um, thank you, Convener. I think um, it would be right for all boards to look at how best they, they deliver services from traditionally known as, as back office services to, secu to make sure they are achieving best value and securing value for money for, um, for public money. Um, and indeed, you know, the, the example that um, prompted NHS Orkney this year perhaps wasn't in the, in the kindness of circumstances, but it's allowed them to, to draw on expertise um, in this function going forward much like NHS Orkney does for um, its clinical services through the, the variety of arrangements it has to receive services from other health boards where, where it doesn't have that level of expertise or facilities on the islands. I ask the Auditor General if this is something that, that you identify um, as an issue or a concern, will you be recommending to boards that they should cooperate to share services in order to make sure that the qualified staff um, are available to provide the function required? Um, I, I think, as Stephen said, a fair amount of that sharing already goes on, not least through the NHS Directors of Finance meeting regularly and having a strong network where they can call on help where it's required. I think the challenge is where a specific issue comes up like this to be able to get the right help quickly enough um, and well enough plugs into what's really happening to be able to make a difference while it's still possible to recover the situation. Um, so there's probably a recommendation about doing that in a, in a more proactive way rather than waiting for a problem to be clearly on the table. Okay, thank you. Liam McCarthy? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Camina. I, I was interested by the point um, Stephen Boyle made there in relation to the, the clinical shared services. Um, obviously, the relationships there are most closely with NHS Grampian and NHS Highland, but uh, for obvious reasons, that wouldn't necessarily have been the, uh, the most appropriate link in relation to the, the, the issues we're, we're discussing here. Uh, it's, uh, as well as the problems within the finance department, I mean, what clearly comes through in this report, and Colin Beattie's right, it, it does make for alarming reading, particularly when um, you are a constituent of, of NHS Orkney as well as um, the uh, elected representative. But it, it brings out very clearly the problems in relation to uh, recruitment uh, and then the, the knock-on consequences in terms of the, the, the high costs of locums. I can understand why there are similarities perhaps in the pressures that both NHS Highland and, and Orkney face in relation to recruitment. But I would, I think, um, expect the similarities to be greater between NHS Orkney and, for example, NHS um, Shetland and, and Western Isles. And I just wonder whether there was anything through the audit process that you could suggest that 
those health boards appear to be getting right in terms of recruitment where, where Otney could perhaps learn, learn lessons. And similarly, in relation to the locum um, uh, procedures, are there things that, um, if this is inevitable, that needs to be done, that could be improved in terms of um, bearing down on those, uh, on those costs? I'll ask Stephen hmm. to come in in a moment. Um, I think the, the context for this is that particularly for the island health boards, losing one or two key people can have a really significant impact because of the scale of what we're talking about. Um, so part of the picture is simply that Orkney has been hit with a number of vacancies this year. It could have been Shetland, it could have been Western Isles, and that unpredictability um, is always a factor that needs to play in. Um, whether there are wider lessons to learn, I'll ask Stephen to pick up on. I think, I think the Auditor General has touched on it. I think the, there, are, the, the, there are not an abundance of, um, of either um, non-clinical non, um, professionals or clinical professionals, and the loss of one person can be um, very significant in the delivery of services. Um, it's clear that um, in terms of NHS Orkney, it does have uh, connections with um, NHS Grampian and NHS Highland in particular but also uh, has forged links with um, their colleagues in Western Isles and Shetland. I think it's the, the Islands Care model uh, as a means of, of sharing best practice. Um, and it, indeed, there is, um, there is no guarantee that um, um, it being faced with particular individual challenging circumstances again, that um, it would be similarly straightforward uh, to resolve. And obviously, recruitment um, is born out of an inability to retain in, in some respects. I mean, are there, are, are there particular examples of, of, of what is happening in, in the other island health authorities where the retention rates are, are higher and therefore they're not being faced with the, the, the problem having to recruit, as the convener says, in, in a market where skills are, are in, in certain areas are really are at a, at a premium and therefore um, the difficulties increase and the cost is increased? There's nothing we're aware of. That's not to say that there may not be lessons to be learned. Um, but I think one of the other clues came out in something Stephen said earlier, uh, that often it's less about the health board or the post than about the individual's personal circumstances, the things that make some people um, willing and indeed very happy to live and work in an island community for a long time may be the things that make it harder for another individual because they've got young children, because they've got a spouse who works, whatever it may be. So factors about the individuals we know have, have made a difference from time to time, as well as potentially there being things about the way the board manages this that can make it easier or harder in what are always difficult circumstances. Can we take you on to the issue of, of the recurring and non-recurring uh, Costs. I mean, obviously, there are there are concerns there at the at the level of of, of non-recurring uh, savings. Sorry, that uh, that NHS Orkney uh, are are uh, making. Uh, perhaps more of a concern, given the earlier predictions of of, of them being recurring uh, savings. Um, but I also note in in paragraph ten of of the report. Uh, an acknowledgement that NHS Orkney is about 12.2 per cent, i.e. 4.8 uh, million below its target funding allocation. There's an acknowledgement of that by the Scottish Government and plans in place um, to increase that um, additionally by half a million in 2015-16 and 3.8 million in 2016-17. Now those in, in, the, in the scheme of NHS Orkney's budget are significant sums. Would it be reasonable to be making recurring savings where there's an acknowledgement of, of underfunding, where there's a plan in place to put that funding in? Um, it, NHS Orkney, like all other health boards, would probably argue that it's, it's made savings down to the bone where it, where it can. The, the danger in making further savings are that you, 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 you dig very deeply into uh, pretty critical services. Um, in terms of the profile that, that, that the convener and other committee colleagues were referring to in terms of an ageing population, the pressures uh, that brings with it in terms of the costs are magnified in an island setting where you've got a dispersed uh, population. And therefore, I, 
Is it reasonable? I mean, is the, should the expectation be that NHS Orkney is looking to make recurring savings, or is it a process of trying to bridge the gap until the additional fun, uh, funding, which is absolutely essential, has been acknowledged by the Scottish Government, is going to be put in place? It's a really good question, and I think as well as the increased funding due over the next two or three years, we're also seeing a move to a new, new hospital, which will provide new opportunities for providing services in different ways and generating longer term savings or efficiency improvements. I think the concern is about making sure that the planned savings are delivered in practice, whether they're recurring or non-recurring, um, and the, the challenge that non-recurring savings bring in that you have to look for them all over again next year. Stephen will know more about the specifics in Orkney. Thank you. Um, it's certainly that planned nature, what we've um, sought to report is the board's performance against its own plan. The, the level of recurring and non-recurring savings that it identified um, in its um, local delivery plan t submissions to the Scottish Government that um, it, it expected to make. Um, non-recurring savings clearly is a, far, is a far more sustainable way um, of securing its financial balance. Um, but NHS Orkney, really over a number of years, um, has used uh, non-recurring savings um, as a means of um, securing its financial position. Um, what's also the case, though, is that some non-recurring um, savings are also used to support non-recurring expenditure, as is the case, um, as the Auditor General has mentioned, that um, with the new hospital um, to be coming online in a couple of years, NHS certainly does have that period between um, it um, opens the new facility to where it is now that it will have non-recurring expenditure. Um, but fundamentally, what we seek to report is um, NHS Orkney's performance against its own um, plans. You gave the example to the convener earlier on of um, the recruitment of um, a senior staff, which then fell through, had to be replaced by, by locum at, at, at short notice. Uh, is is that the sort of, of, of thing that is given? I mean, are there other examples? Because in a sense, something of that scale c can, uh, in, a, in a smaller budget, almost <laughs> account for a, a, a significant percentage of, the, uh, of either the um, non-recurring uh, cost uh, or the, the, the problems being identified um, in a single year within the, in this report. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, um, a good example, uh, Mr MacArthur, as to um, over and above the, um, the, the vacancy management. Um, I suspect the, there, there will be many, um, be it um, in a non-clinical setting perhaps, um, identified savings on uh, facilities costs on the, on the estate. I think that perhaps, um, as has been suggested around the, um, the level of um, ongoing upkeep um, around um, the old hospital relative to uh, the new facility, but um, if I... Uh, I can think of a better example. Uh, I'll come back and answer your question later. That's it. That's good. Can I just clarify something, uh, Mr. Barr? You, you mentioned um, vacancy management as a, a non-recurring saving, but if a, a vacancy runs beyond one year, um, or indeed is um, eliminated permanently, surely that would then become a, a recurring saving. It can be another thing that, that the key to that is the the point of which uh, the vacancy, uh, the duration of that vacancy. And is there a balance in what you see there then between the non-recurring savings due to vacancies and the recurring vacancies that are due to savings? Yeah, the, um, I think it would be, um, in terms of the recurring nature uh, of savings, we would expect these to be planned you know, to be identified in um, be it a, a service redesign um, analysis coming through in a workforce plan um, and the connections that that would then have with with a financial plan whereas with the non-recurring nature would be just the circumstances that the health board encountered uh, as it went through the recruitment process or the or the time that it took uh, to complete any uh, recruitment cycle okay thank you mary scanlon and then Willie coffee uh, <coughs> thank you. Um, I'd just like to start with the, the vacancy management um, and the point the convener has just made that if that continues over a certain period, uh, the non-recurring does actually become recurring. And I want, obviously, well, is vacancy management being used to balance the books? 
And the reason I'm, you know, is it a recruitment problem or is it a financial problem? And the reason I mention that is that uh, in recent weeks, the local newspapers have been doing FOIs into NHS Highland and uh, discovered, for example, that 104 uh, patients had to go elsewhere in Scotland in recent months for orthopaedic surgery, which I support is important to get their surgery. But we're actually finding that, uh, you know, it's not all about recruitment and patient waiting times are longer now. Uh, I don't think I've ever known a time that I've heard more from patients in NHS Grampian, because I cover Murray, uh, and NHS Highland, given the waits for diagnosis, the waits for scanners, the waits for treatment, the waits to see a surgeon. Um, so it appears to me that this is impacting seriously on patient care. I appreciate you're mainly looking at the finances, but uh, is it reasonable to say, given that 104 patients in recent months are travelling elsewhere, that this is this is becoming very serious indeed. Um, I'll start with a specific point you asked about vacancies. And it's clear that vacancies can can be used to manage the finances by choosing not to fill a post for a period. Um, and if that post is required, then it's likely that will have an impact on service levels, whatever the job is, whether it's a consultant post or a key person in the finance team or it may be a difficulty in recruiting somebody, which gives you an unintended saving, but also, again, has an impact on the service you're able to provide. Um, Stephen may be able to tell you more about what we know about what's happening in NHS Highland, but I think the key is in the point he made about workforce planning linked to financial planning. Every board should be clear what staff it needs to provide the services it's responsible for. Its financial plan should um, be very closely linked to that, um, and vacancy management other than at the margins isn't a recurring or sustainable way of making the savings that may be needed to, to balance the budget. If what you need is to reshape your staffing, then you should do that and recruit to the new staffing structure rather than keep posts um, held empty for long-term periods. Short-term flexibility may be sensible, long-term periods isn't. Stephen, do you want to add? Around a 350 mile round trip for patients before and after surgery, I think it's worth Absolutely, and, and clearly there are particular circumstances yeah. in both of the boards we're talking about yeah. today, no question about that. Stephen. Thank you, Regina. I'm, I'm not sure if I have any um, specific examples of the nature of specialties and um, its impact that it's having on um, patients in Grampian uh, or um, NHS Highland, Miss Scanlon, that would, um, that would support that. Okay, can I, can I just a second to go to, um, you did say it was the board's responsibility for the finances, and it's really Colin, on the back of Colin Beatty's question. I don't think in the three years that I've been on this committee that I've ever actually seen a, a paper which states, and I quote, the chief executive and director of finance discussed the board's financial position with the Scottish Government, which of course they should do, in December 2013, but didn't formally advise the board uh, about the fact that they weren't going to break even. Sorry, it's page five in the your section uh, 22 report. But, uh, I mean, I would have thought that's tantamount to gross misconduct because one month before the end of the financial year, that board is made, NHS Highland, is made aware that it won't break even. How serious is that? We understand that the board's financial position was discussed informally um, with the board during board development sessions, uh, but I agree with you, it's, it's a, the sort of matter that should be formally on the board's agenda and available for the board to understand, to discuss and to challenge where appropriate. Um, we've talked before to this committee about each board's really central role in governance in being able to take that big picture of the way the finances are looking, the way that clinical and other performance is looking, and to provide the level of oversight, scrutiny, challenge and support that's required. One of the reasons why these reports are here before you um, is the concern about financial management and for Highland, that particular question of transparency. It's very difficult for us as an audit committee, and to be fair, the Scottish Government, to hold that board to account when they're being kept in the dark by their chief executive and their financial director, as you've stated here. 
and the Chief Executive and I think the Director of Finance are both members of the Board. The question is both um, whether the Board was able to fulfil its role and the legitimate public interest in concerns like this. Uh, we were talking earlier about the um, need for debate about the way financial and other targets work together in the health service. Um, I think it's uh, entirely legitimate to say these are the sort of issues that um, should be discussed at the appropriate level of detail by a Board. Question. Sorry, Sorry, can I just stick with that for a moment? Because th th there is a significant issue here, both about um, the staff and the board. Um, paragraph 6 actually um, indicates that in the top of page 5, the actual year-to-day outturned position showed significant overspend against budgets each month. Monthly information prepared by the finance team for board members and the Scottish Government had reported that the deficit would be addressed from management planned actions. So the senior staff reported to the board that the deficit would be addressed from management planned actions. But then you go on to say that the chief executive and the director of finance discussed the problem with the Scottish Government, but not the board. Now, I think Mary Scanlon's right in the dereliction of duty, surely the senior staff are obliged to report to the board. Otherwise, what is the point of having a board? If they believe, uh, you know, well, maybe clarify for me, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the chief executive and the director of finance and other senior staff should report directly to the Scottish Government rather than the board. Is that the case, that the board are irrelevant in this? No, I've said, convener, that in my view these are exactly the sorts of issues that should be on the board's agenda. Um, the board is responsible for scrutiny and oversight of the overall performance of the board. We're told um, that the board discussed these issues informally as part of a board development session rather than on a formal board agenda, but in my view that doesn't meet best practice. Stephen may want to add more of the background of what we know in this particular Sorry, case. Sorry, just before Mr Boyle does that, mm. Are these staff still in post? Um, there has been one departure from uh, Raigmore Hospital, I think, from the, from the NHS Highland Board. Um, otherwise, people are still in post. So, Mr Boyle. Thank you, Convener. Um, as the Auditor General notes, that um, we would have expected that the, uh, the forecast financial position, uh, which did state um, that it would break even, but to be uh, compensated by planned management actions, would include more detail um, um, around what planned management actions uh, would entail, um, and we didn't see that uh, during during the course of the year. Um, by way of context, I suppose that is the NHS Highland in um, in previous years um, has also relied on uh, non-recurring um, savings to secure its financial position and has achieved its break-even. Um, and in the extent of brokerage or uh, additional funding from the Scottish Government that it, that it sought um, of two and a half million is only a very small percentage of its overall allocation. But nonetheless, we would, would have expected that the, there would have been it would have been clearer um, to board members the um, the risks around its achievement of break even. But you know, the more I hear, the worse this becomes. Because you know, frankly, I think it's a scandal that these senior officers are actually treating the board like mushrooms. They're best kept in the dark. Because not only did they not advise the board at the time, but they did discuss it with the Scottish Government, but the same paragraph actually says that officers did not formally report the brokerage agreed with the Scottish Government to the board until close to the end of the financial year. What is the point of having a board if you don't discuss these serious issues with them? I think the word formally in both sentences in, is important. Um, from uh, our discussions with the board, uh, we understand that there were informal discussions in board development sessions. And I agree with you, convener, that these are the sorts of issues which should be on a formal board agenda uh, with proper papers and proper minuting of the action that's been taken as a key part of good governance. But actually, I, I think the fact that there was informal discussion makes it even worse, because informal discussion won't appear in any records anywhere that the public can examine and hold the board to account. The nod, the wink, the private conversation that there's a problem frankly seems to be a way of getting round public scrutiny 
and proper public accountability. So either the board are complicit in a situation where um, there is no proper governance here, or the board have been kept in the dark by senior management. But somewhere right along the line, there is, I think, a chronic failure of this board to hold the executives to account, or else a failure of the board to properly advise um, the, uh, of the chief exec or the, the senior staff to advise the board. Either way, it's significant failure. It may well be both, but to have a board that is not formally told be about discussions with the Scottish government about brokerage, I think is an outrage. You know, and, and I don't know whether this is happening in other boards or whether it's just a local practice. But you know, I think, as, as Colin Beatty has suggested, um, we do need to have some discussions with the, the Scottish government about this because there's something badly wrong here. One of the reasons why the report is here is that the way this was handled means there is no formal record of papers to the board and minutes of decisions taken, and that makes it hard for us to um, see and understand uh, the level of board discussion and the actions taken. Uh, but those requirements are in place for good reasons, as you say, good governance um, and public accountability. Right, OK. Mary Scanlon, sorry. Before I go to my final question, which is looking at the way forward, um, page 13, uh, second paragraph, uh, and I quote, until February 2014, the board was forecasting that it would break even at the end of the financial year. Now, you've actually told us that they had informal discussions. They were aware that there would be £2.5 million brokerage. Those discussions took place between the Chief Executive, the Financial Director and the Scottish Government in December. So were the board lying that they would break even? Uh, or, or were, they, uh, were they lying? Were they unaware of the brokerage? Or you know, were they just being uh, economical with the truth? I think what paragraph 7 is describing is, is an evolving picture. Um, Stephen will keep me right. My understanding is that the December 2013 conversation um, was about the financial position of the board and the challenges that were being faced, particularly at Ragmore Hospital. In February 2014, that discussion had moved on to being about the potential requirement for brokerage. And as the report says, the board was formally advised about the need for brokerage close to the end of the financial year. Um, so those discussions were evolving. What's clear is that they weren't happening formally on the board's agenda um, and that the plans for closing the gap between the month-by-month um, -month position and the forecast break-even position um, were not detailed enough to give us uh, satisfaction that the picture was being managed well. What we have is a formal forecast of break-even by the end of the financial year and an informal knowledge that they, they would not break even, they required £2.5 million brokerage. The, the picture appears to have been that the formal discussions at the board didn't take full account of the financial, financial position of the board um, and that that evolved until right up at the end of the financial year when the need for brokerage was reported. Stephen okay. may well want to add to that if he's much closer to the picture on the ground than I am. I think the Auditor General's understanding is uh, consistent uh, with my own um, and certainly the, um, the formal uh, reporting um, of the requirement for brokerage um, as, as the paper notes, and you've said Ms Scanlon, didn't take place right up until uh, very close to, to the end of the, the financial year, but based on the uh, February um, in-year position. So the formal, the formal position and the informal knowledge were quite different? Um, yeah, I think that's what we... Um, we, we'd agree with. Can, I, can I just look forward to the final paragraph on page uh, 13, case study one? Now, I hope you'll forgive me, but can you please explain to me, uh, in order to break even at the end of the financial year, this requires to achieve a £12.3 million improvement on the financial position. £9.9 .9 million of that uh, relates to Ragmore Hospital. What is a 12.3 million improvement on the financial position? Is that 12.3 million less that they have to spend in order to break even? Or is that 12.3 million of efficiency savings in one department that will be taken and reinvested in another? 
I just don't understand, and I'm sorry, convener, what an improvement in the financial position of 12.3 million means. Thank you, Ms. Gannon, the, the 12.3 million um, that you refer to is the is the board's forecast year-end outturn, um, as at the end of um, the 14-15 uh, financial year. Deficit at the end of the year? That would be um, what they would be projecting that their deficit would be if they didn't take any um, steps to, to address that and meet their break even uh, target on their revenue position. So, if they're projecting a 12.3 million deficit, and I'm sorry for being the daft lassie, but I'd rather get it, make it understood. If they're projecting at this point in time a 12.3 million deficit, does that mean that they have to cut back their spending? by 12.3 million in order to break even on the 31st of March next year. Um, just one point of clarity, I think the board is, is actually projecting a break even position, but has identified that, um, and, and sorry this is a, a not, not clear, I'll try and be as clear as I possibly can. I don't understand how they're projecting break even, but they've got a 12.3 million deficit. So, so they are projecting that they will break even, um, but have identified that they have a gap um, of 12.3 million um, as a forecast gap, rather, as things currently stand uh, at the end of period five of the financial year and indeed need to take uh, steps that would address the 12.3 million pound gap that they currently have. So they need to cut back on their spending by 12.3 million by the end of the financial year in order to break even. Is that accurate? Um, cut back on spending or identify other um, revenue streams or deliver services in a different way. Okay, so 9.9 .9 million of that relates to Rigmore Hospital. That's a huge financial improvement or cutback or whatever you want. That is identified at that 10, well, 10 million at Rigmore Hospital. Is that reasonable to expect NHS Highland to find 10 million of cuts, efficiency, savings or financial improvements, whatever we want to call it, in six months? I think that would be, um, that would be a very challenging thing to achieve in, in the remaining months of the so. financial year. Um, but it, it broadly mirrors the financial um, position of, uh, of the board, uh, certainly last year. Um, as we note in the paper, that 9.5 million of the, um, the financial challenges faced by the board are attributable to Rigmore. So the, the trend um, is broadly consistent. Okay, have you been given an assurance? Uh, have you been told where these savings or how this deficit will be met? Uh, have you been given a future plan uh, in order to break even from NHS Island? And is that something that we could see within this committee? I think the reference I made in my opening remarks to the board's um, uh, programme board, which is set up specifically to try and close this gap. Um, it's that board which is both monitoring the situation and developing the plans. I think it's not a single plan, but a series of plans for closing the gap in this financial year of 12 million and making sure that the longer term challenges, which Stephen's referred to in his report, are also met. Is that accurate, Stephen? Okay. Yeah. Um, before I bring other, there are at least three other members wishing to, to come in. Auditor General, I'm aware the you have to attend the uh, the local government and regeneration committee meeting to give evidence. Um, I, I don't know, are you content to leave at this point and leave your colleagues to, to deal with further questions or do you wish to stay um, for the, the rest of the questions? Which government committee is content for me to stay with the committee until you're happy on this item okay. and then I'll That's move good. on. Thank you very much Thank for you. that. Um, James Dornan had a quick question and then Willie Coffey. Yes, thank you, Convener. It was just based on this, uh, these board and informal and formal board meetings. Did you get any sense when you were doing the audit that in these informal discussions that they had what they thought was a plan to uh, fill this two and a half million pounds? Or was it really a case of they were saying one thing in public, another thing in private? Or was it a case of they were just sitting there hoping that something would turn up? Um, it, it's difficult for me to say what is, is actually discussed in the informal sessions because I think it's been said that we're neither present at these meetings nor do we receive uh, minutes uh, from them. Um, it perhaps only could be um, a conjecture, uh, Mr Dornan, that the, 
the experience of NHS Highlands financial position has been such that it um, has delivered its financial position in previous years um, and um, I expect anticipated that it would do so again in 13-14 but the, uh, the late um, detail around the, um, the challenges in Rake Moore compounded its financial position and prevented it doing so and as such required brokerage. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Uh, you came in earlier for the second time here, convener, on a number of the points I wanted to raise, but nevertheless, I, I, I want to ask the Auditor General a couple of questions. This, this story reminds me of the Western Isles um, case a number of years ago when I served in this committee when significant management failures were, were pinpointed then, and we, we hoped that uh, lessons were, well, they were certainly learned in the Western Isles, uh, and, and it looks as though similar, without knowing the detail, of course, similar management failures are, are occurring occurring again. Um, what's extremely worrying, of course, is that it seems to be pointing to a, a lack of either ability or willingness to scrutinise what's being said by whom and to whom. Here, you know, you, you can't seriously say that you're going to outturn on balance uh, and project, you know, a, a deficit shortfall of it by management actions and, and not even decide to inquire what these might be and who said them. That sounds like what we heard in the Western Isles some, some years ago. I, I, I can't think of any possible reasonable rational explanation that might ex explain this other than, other, well, I'm not going to say it. I just can't understand why that would be the case. But could, could I ask you, though, I mean, when was it in, in the stage, in the process, that it became immediately obvious and clear that the brokerage was actually required? Was it right at the end of the financial, financial year, month to go or so? When was it? When did it occur? I think the picture that we've tried to paint for you is a sense of it being clear that there were real financial pressures from at least December in 2013 onwards. Um, and uh, although there had been, as Stephen says, a history of making the savings that were required in previous years, the difficulties were compounded this year by the weaknesses in financial control at Ragmore and by the very ambitious work that is happening in Highland to um, integrate adult health and social care under the Health Board's leadership. Um, I think the question is uh, how well understood the reasons for that financial position were and particularly how well positioned the board was to ask the right questions as you're suggesting about what, what the underlying reasons were, how good the plans were for moving towards break even and what other action may be required. As Stephen says, we can't be sure about that because the meetings weren't held formally. We don't have access to papers or minutes as a result of that. But that is the board's responsibility and it's it, the good governance requirements for good reasons, as the committee is exploring just now. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just ringing another alarm bell, convener, about, about the past experience that, that we had. We had, we had examples there where even internal audit um, recommendations were, were being ignored. Uh, you know, and, so, and it raises the question about how on earth do we ensure internal or external audit that what's being said and what's being reported is actually done and scrutinised. It's one thing to report and recommend, but it's another to actually do it and for someone else, if necessary externally, to come in at a late stage and, and see that it's not being done. But that, that has to be in process. That's the responsibility of the board, as you've said there. But it seems as though the same mistakes perhaps have been made again here with these two particular boards, and I think lessons need to be learned uh, pretty, pretty quickly, I think, convener, to to try and stop this happening again. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Colin Keir. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, my question is similar uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the board meeting, and we know it's been reported to the board later on, but um, maybe I've missed something in what's been said, and I apologise if I have, but um, it's really trying to get an idea of what the, the actions of the non-executive directors of the board are saying some sort of response to see if um, there is some form of dissent or comment or acceptance or whatever. And I'm not, maybe I don't know if I've missed this or you're not, it's not, that's information not available as it's minutes that you've not seen. Um, but it would be interesting to know if the, not just the executive members who are obviously responsible for the day to day running, but the non execs who are supposed to be there for a specific reason are actually up to the job of um, carrying this on. Anything on that point? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Keir. The, um, 
It's maybe worth noting that the board um, has issued a response to the Section 22 report stating that it takes the report very seriously and, uh, and attends to um, address the points in it. Um, the, the, we've, we've commented already about the, the, the timeline and the, the information being provided to the board in both formal and, uh, and informal sessions. Um, and perhaps worth noting that um, the, the basis for the Auditor General Section 22 reports is the annual report on the audit. And um, I presented that to NHS Highlands Audit Committee, um, I think uh, September of memory of 2014, if memory serves me correct. Uh, and that meeting, um, um, it's, it's clear that there is a there's an action plan um, that accompanies the report, along with recommendations for, for improvement that, that I make, um, and they are uh, responded to positively in my mind about the, the, the next steps. So they were they were discussed in full at that meeting. I would have liked to have known what the initial response was. I know they're doing the action plan. I know they have to agree a series of forward plans to. Uh, alleviate the, the problem, uh, but it was actually to try and find out what the initial um, formal reply from the rest of the board was <laughs> to finding out that brokerage was required at virtually the last meeting of the year, even allowing for the fact that uh, if they were accepting of an informal discussion, which brings in the problem of, well, shouldn't the non-execs be pushing for that to be formal formalised? Or did they know? But what was the initial reaction? Because I'd really like to know uh, as to how the board, when confronted by this, actually uh, reacted initially, because it would give us an, a real idea if you know there was problems with the executive function of the board. Probably the, the, the best answer I can do that was from my experience of, of that meeting that... Um, some non-executives who serve on the audit committee, which is not all of the non-executives um, of the board, there was a, um, a degree of uh, recognition that they were familiar with the, the board's financial position. Whether, um, whether that then translated into an expectation or understanding that it would require brokerage from the Scottish Government to secure break-even, I'm not sure I could be, um, give you that clarity. Yeah, OK. Uh, can I thank the Auditor General and her colleagues uh, for that. Um, Auditor General, um, just before you leave, um, the next item um, on the Section 23 report, we have um, responses both from the Scottish Government and yourself. Can I just ask you one question before you leave? Um, in your response, you say that um, my report on the NHS in Scotland 2013-14 will comment on the number of settlement agreements that include the categories you refer to confidentiality clauses and highlight any concerns raised by local auditors. I can't see any reference to it in the report. Do you want, it's you? not in the report, and we are still planning to report back to you on that issue, Convener. We want to take the time to make sure we've got the information absolutely right before it comes to you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item, uh, as I said, is the... Well, if I break just after this, because I think we should be able to deal with this fairly quickly... Um, consideration of the responses from Scottish Government and the Auditor General. Um, members um, can either agree to note the responses or to decide whether to take any further uh, evidence or indeed refer it to another committee. Um, any comments from members? Agree to note? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, at that, we will go into private session and we will take a break. Thank you.